All right, Santa girl. Don't just forget about all your troubles in your life. We receive the power. That's right now. It ain't about you. We give you all of the glory right now. We honor you, Jesus. We honor you. Why y'all? For you're the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Yeah. Together, together, together. That's why we worship. Worship. Oh, I need some believers up in here, sir. Come on. We worship the you yeah. in this house. I, I need a witness. In the sanctuary, a living sacrifice. We give you all the give glory. You all the glory. We give you all of the glory yeah. right now. Do I have any true believers up in here? You're the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Yeah. Lord. Oh, that's why we worship yeah. you. Yeah. You, you don't have to be older, praise him. Come on, young folk. I got some young folks I, up in here. I know that the hour We have put together some suggestions for you that we believe will help you to get the most out of your worship experience. Listen to these 10 suggestions and attempt to implement them in your home as you transform your home into your sanctuary. Be on time. Worship service starts at 10.15. Sing along with the song leader. Stand when taking communion. Bow your head during prayers and pray along with the prayer leader. Take off your PJs. Dress reverently. Clothes affect how we feel and how we behave. Have your Bible open during the sermon. Put everything aside and focus on the worship. Worship along with family members and not all on separate devices. Pay attention to your environment and reduce any distractions. Prepare for service. By preparing your mind with prayer, meditation, or religious music. Father, I thank you for all of the blessings you've given us, dear Lord. And thank you for the men and women who serve in your church and in the ministry to go do your will. And Father, bless those that teach us your word. Father, I know right now the work is difficult for many reasons. Number one, we can't meet face to face and we can't do things physically and we have to work through a limited capacity through a digital format. And Father, we must not only endure, Father, the things going on during a pandemic, but we also have to endure spiritual warfares in our homes with our families. And the burdens, Father, can be great for the congregation, but we pray that you always guide us and be with us. Dear Lord, be with our minister who has studied your word and is sharing that word with the rest of us. And we pray that we can take the word and apply it to our lives. And Father, take it out to a sin-cursed world. We also pray that this worship of you today is pleasing to you. We pray that you be with each and every family here at Pearland West. Father, for Satan's wiles and the wiles of the day of the devil father is coming after all of us but we know that if we just follow your word and obey your truth we can stand father and the victory is ours dear lord we ask that you continue to watch over us and keep us as we pray these things for your son jesus christ amen Yes, over and over. Well, you know that he gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. What a love, Lord, makes.
so glad you shed your blood for me. I'm so glad you set me free. Now come to a part of our worship service, the communion, where we remember the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We find scriptural example in Acts chapter 20 and verse number 7, where it reads, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech unto midnight. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 23 says, For I have received of the Lord... That which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. For as often as ye eat the bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink of the cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Verse number 24 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says, And when he had given thanks, he brake it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Let's pray for the bread together. Most holy and honorable Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us so much that you gave your only begotten Son to die for our sins. Forgive us of all of our sins by word, thought, or deed so that we may take this bread that represents your son's broken body on the cross with a clean hands and a pure heart. These and other blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may now take the bread. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 25 says, After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray for the cup together. Again, Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his willingness to die for the for our sins and him taking our place on the cross of Calvary. 
Will you take this cup that represents your son's shed blood? For without the shedding of blood, there could be no forgiveness of sin. These and other blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us take the cup. We want to instruct you on how you can give your tithes and offering online. You simply go to the official Pearland West Church of Christ homepage at pearlandwestcoc.org. And in the upper left at the top of the page, you will see online giving. You simply click that link and it takes you to our online giving page. Under choose a fund, click general giving, the amount you would like to contribute, and the option to include a memo and the frequency of how you would like your contribution to be. You then click no thanks and click on the con contribute button. This takes you to the PayPal page where you enter an email or a mobile number. You also have the option to contribute via a debit or credit card, after which you click next and your contribution is entered. You will also notice a QR code in the middle of the screen or in the right corner of the screen right now, and you can use the camera of your smartphone to capture that QR code and it will take you directly to the online giving page and you can follow the exact same instructions that I just gave. Thank you, church family, and God bless. We now come to a part of our service, which is contribution. We find recorded in 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, starting at verse 6, and it reads, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according to purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Let us pray for the contribution. Kind Master, we come to you giving you all thanks, honor, and glory, and praise. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity to give back that of which you have given us a small portion. Father, we pray for the Pearland West uh, congregation that we use it in a timely and fashionable way for the upbuilding of your kingdom. This is our prayer in your son and our savior, Jesus Christ. Let us all say amen. I sing praises to your name. Oh Lord, praises to your name. Oh
morning everyone and welcome to the Paraland West worship experience. Let's continue with the thought that we've been working on. We've been looking at the text in Isaiah chapter 55 operating from the overarching theme of sharpening our vision. Sharpening our vision. We've been looking at the topic of a call to missional service. Come go with me real fast. Isaiah chapter 55 Let's look at verses 1 and read through verse 7. Come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good and you will delight in the riches of fair. Give ear and come to me. Hear me, that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations that do not know you will hasten to you because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will freely pardon. Now from these passages, we've looked at primarily two subjects thus far. We've looked at the idea of mission, that God calls us to mission. He calls us to be engaged in his work, his mission, missional service. We pointed out that God never calls you in without sending you out. And he expects his children to be actively engaged in his mission. Secondly, we talked about the message. The message is very, very important. We pointed out, however, that when we think in terms of the message, we understand that the message places an emphasis on God's grace and not upon man's labor. We pointed out last week that you have to look at the heart and understand what the essence of a man's life actually is working toward. But that means that we have to look first of all at what it is exactly your heart seeks. And then secondly, we have to look at how your heart goes about seeking it. Now today, we don't want to deal with the mission. We don't want to deal with the message. Some people have said, well, brotherly, I'm engaged in the mission and I'm carrying the message, but I just don't feel propelled to go out the way you're talking about. How am I supposed to accomplish that? 
That's where we want to start today. Today we want to look at the fact that God gives us a motivation and God gives us a power to accomplish it. He gives us the motivation and the power to engage in mission. He gives us the motivation and the power to carry the message. Well, where is it? Where is that motivation? Where is that power? Is right there. Is right there in the text. Come go back and look at Isaiah 55, but zoom in on verse number three with me. Give ear and come to me, hear me, that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. Now, when we look at this text, Isaiah makes an assumption. Isaiah assumes that his readers know the Bible. Isaiah assumes that those who are reading the text know the Bible. We don't know the Bible as well as I guess the readers did then, and therefore sometimes things that he says don't immediately evoke what they are supposed to evoke within us. When he talks about this everlasting covenant, the everlasting covenant that he promised to David in the second part of the verse, look at it again with me. Give ear and come to me, hear me, that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. Now, first of all, it's tapping in to one of the main themes of the Bible. One of the main themes of the Bible, and that's the idea of covenant. Covenant. A covenant is a binding covenant solid, intimate relationship. In the case that we're talking about here, having a covenant with David, God is saying, I am going to have a binding, solid, intimate relationship with David. When David is talking about covenant, and even when we talk about covenant, what we're saying is we are going to have a binding, a solid, an intimate relationship with the God of the universe. That's a powerful idea in and of itself. Through the Bible, God makes covenants with men. God made a covenant with Adam. And God made a covenant with Abraham. God made a covenant with Moses. And God made a covenant with David. And he makes a covenant with the children of Israel. Now, it looks like covenants are apparently quite possible. It looks like a relationship with God is quite possible. However, that word everlasting really pushes on a kind of sore place. If you really read the Bible well, and if you know the Bible well, as you read the Bible, it's a big question. In fact, there are some places where you can read in God's word, and even within the context of a chapter, it looks like God is saying, I will never leave or forsake you ever. I will always be faithful to you. And because you are doing this, I am now dropping you and I am rejecting you. Sometimes in the same chapter, it makes a swing where God is saying, I'm with you. And then later he's saying, I will drop you. Now, over the years, whether we know it or not, sometimes deliberately, but I think more unconsciously, most have tried to resolve that tension. What does that mean that sometimes God's covenants seem to be conditional and then other times God's covenants seem to be unconditional. How do you resolve that tension? Most of us either fall into what I like to call either the traditional moral people or the liberal secular relativistic type people. Some say, you know what, when it comes down to it, when I really think about this thing, yeah, God is loving. But at the end of the day, the commands trump the promises. Yes, God promises a lot, but unless you do what he commands, God is going to drop you. So basically, when it comes right down to it, if you want a relationship with God, you had better live up to the standard. 
Then there are people on the other side of the coin who take a look at other things the Bible says about unconditional love, and they say, well, look, of course, God is just. And of course, God wants you to live a good life. But at the end of the day, God's promises always will trump God's commands. At the end of the day, though he tells you to live in certain ways, in the end, God is going to embrace you and God is going to accept you anyway. Well, do you know what happens when we start looking at these various, uh, uh, what appear to be contradictions in the text? If you try to resolve that conflict in the Bible, you ask yourself and you, you have this tension in your heart trying to understand, well, are covenants conditional or are covenants unconditional? And will God uh, honor his a covenant with me no matter what, or are there conditions attached to God honoring his covenant with me? You say, well, uh, it, it is really basically conditional. Or you decide, well, you know what? The more I think about it, it it's, it's basically totally unconditional. Well, let me tell you something. If you try to do that, if you try to resolve that within yourself, I'm just letting you know right here and right now, you're not being very converted. You are not being changed. You are not being amazed. You are not being propelled. You are not being melted down. You are going back and forth, arguing with yourself. Is it unconditional? You know you try your best or it's conditional. You better be good and you better to get it right. If you want to get in, you better work pretty hard. And you go back and forth with yourself and with others arguing that point. When you read the Old Testament, the Bible deliberately does not resolve that tension. God's word does not resolve that tension within itself. In fact, you realize that that tension that exists within the scripture helps propel the narrative forward. You're asking, well, what do you mean by that, Brother Lee? What do you mean? Well, this tension is this tension. It's this suspense. When you're reading the Bible, the question keeps coming up. Is God going to finally just give up on his people? When you read through the word of God, how many times have you seen situations where men seem to have turned their backs on God? And the question that comes into your mind is, is God going to finally just give up on this people? But then you say, but what about his love. How can he give up on the people if he loves them the way that he says that he does? Or you'll say, well, will God just give in and let his people be the idiots that they actually are? But then what about his holiness? If he just allows these idiots to do whatever they want to do, what about the holiness of God? Will he give up on his people? Will he give in to his people? What is it going to be? What is God ultimately going to do? The Bible in the the Old Testament never resolves it. Those issues are never resolved in Old Testament scripture. You're asking, you mean it just is, is a paradox that we just have to live with? No, it's not a paradox, not really. You're saying, well, is it a contradiction in God's word that we have to just endure? No, it's not a contradiction. You ask, well, Brother Lee, where does it get resolved? Where, where does that issue get resolved? Let me tell you exactly where it gets resolved. It gets resolved resolved on the cross. The last thing that Buddha said when he died, according to his text, was you have to strive without ceasing. He says, keep working, keep working hard. Buddha says, labor, labor, labor. But the last thing that Jesus said when he was on the cross was, it is finished. The work, the testalestai, the Greek word means I have accomplished it. The testalestai, I have finished it. 
on the cross, Jesus Christ fulfilled the conditions so that we could have God's love and get this, we could have God's love unconditionally. The real question is, is your relationship with God a conditional relationship or is your relationship with God an unconditional relationship? And I'm letting you know right now, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. We have to buy this without cost. Do you notice the paradox is even maintained in the imagery we have here in the book of Isaiah. I want you to come back and go to Isaiah 55 with me. Let's look at verses 1 and 2. Come all of you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the riches of fair. Now, did you notice what that text says? That text says, if you are thirsty, come to the waters and you can come who have no money and you can buy and you can eat. Come buy without money. Come buy without cost. Wait a minute. Somebody says, if it's without cost, you don't buy. If it is without cost, you just take. What do you mean buy without cost? because it is incredibly expensive. Let me tell you how expensive it was. It was incredibly expensive to Jesus Christ. It's absolutely free to you. It's absolutely free to me, but it was expensive to Jesus Christ. And if you know that, if you see him on that cross, seeing Jesus on that cross saying, it is finished. If you see Jesus on that cross saying that I have traversed every inch of the infinite distance between you and God, I've traversed every inch of it. There is nothing left for you to do but to admit that you need what I have done. That's the only thing that's required of us. When we talk about the love of God and what God has done, we have to humble ourselves and understanding it's not about who we are, it's not about what we have, it's not about what we have done, Done, but Jesus Christ himself has traversed every inch the infinite distance that exists between you and God and Jesus has covered that distance completely and there's nothing left for you to do. That's what will convert the heart is when we admit that you are that sinful. That's hard for some of us to do. Admit that you are that sinful. Admit that you are actually that lost. Admit that you are actually that loved. Our pride doesn't want to admit it. Our pride doesn't want to admit that we are even that loved. God's love constitutes and sustains me. God is the creator. We are the creature. Too often when we start thinking about creation and we read about creation, we start looking around at the world and we start looking at the elements and looking at the sky and looking at the animals. What we fail to understand is that we too are a part of creation. As a part of creation, God constitutes me. God sustains me. God is creator. I am creature. We live not from our own power, but always from the endless creative love of God himself. God's love is the innermost principle of 
all existence. God's love is the foundational principle of all reality, the basis of our dignity, the basis of our identity as a person, and the starting point for rightly even understanding ourselves. It starts with the love of God. Our pride doesn't want to admit that the only way that we are going to get loved is freely. The only way that we're going to get loved is freely, that we can't even earn it ourselves. Our dignity, our identity as a person is not measured in terms of your intelligence. Our dignity, our identity, it isn't measured in terms of your talents, your dignity, your identity, it isn't measured in terms of your physical prowess or your physical abilities. Your dignity, our identity, is not measured in terms of our wealth. Neither is our dignity or our identity measured in terms of our personal achievements or even our personal goodness. Instead, we need to understand that our dignity and our identity are determined by a love that never, ever leaves us. The yet to be born the not so talented, the limited or the infirmed, the poor and the elderly, even the reprobate and the depraved count as people. They count as a person because just like the wealthy and just like the healthy and just like the good and just like the bad, we are all held in life by a love that delights in us. We want to be independent. Too many times we want to be self-possessed. Too many times we want to be self-sufficient. But as creatures and not the creator, we must acknowledge that we are alive or we even exist because of the love of God. If you are willing to admit that, do you see what it says? If you are willing to admit that, that great verse in Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 15 explodes and comes alive. Come go with me, Isaiah 57, and let's look at verse 15. For this is what the high and lofty one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also within him who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Do you hear what God is saying to you? He is saying, I am the high and I am the lofty one. I am the one who dwells in the high places and I am the one who dwells in the holy place. I dwell in the heavens, but I also dwell with anybody who is humbled, anybody who finally says, I surrender, Lord, everything to you. Do you know what the gospel is all about? The gospel, do you understand what the message is? All you need is need. I need you to hear me and listen to me carefully. All you need is need. All you need is nothing. All you need is to admit that you have nothing and that you cannot earn it. Think about it. All you need is nothing. Most people don't have that, unfortunately. Most people refuse to allow themselves to be in that posture. But all you need is nothing. Most people cannot empty themselves of themselves. Most people are the personal greatest obstacle in their own accomplishment for what it is they say they desire and that they want spiritually. If you realize that, if you see Jesus Christ fulfilling the conditions so that we can receive it unconditionally, to see the law by love fulfilled and hear his pardoning voice transforms a slave into a child and a duty 
into a choice is knowing that it is expensive and yet at the same time is free is knowing that is conditional yet for us is totally unconditional and therefore we understand I am more wicked than I ever dared believed, but I am more loved than I ever dared hope. That will make you a people of a mission. That will make you a people that carry a message. That will give you the motivation you need to carry the message on the mission that God desires you to carry. Do you know why? If you realize you are a sinner that has been saved totally by grace, on the one hand, you recognize that you are so flawed, you have so many issues that God had to die for you. So when you think about that just by itself, how dare you feel superior to anybody? You are not Christian because you are better in any way. You are not Christian because you have a richer understanding of doctrine. You're not a Christian because you live so much better of a life. You're not a Christian because you are better anything. So how in the world can you ever look down on somebody else? On the other hand, how can you be scared of what they think? You have been so humbled by the gospel that you can't be superior to people with whom you talk, but you've been so affirmed by the gospel that you never need to be afraid of anybody. That will make you men and women of mission. Notice what Paul tells the church in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 10. Come and look at that with me. You are God's workmanship created in Jesus Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. As I wrap this up this morning, here's what I need you to understand. There are hands out there that only you can hold. There are people out there that only you can reach. There are hearts breaking out there that only you can can heal your particular gender, your particular race, your particular ethnicity, your particular sorrows, your particular experiences, your particular age, your everything makes you like a fingerprint. You have a unique fingerprint just by your presence that can only accomplish things that you can accomplish. There are certain people out there that God wants to touch through you. God needs your fingerprint on those specific lives, and they're not going to be touched without you. So I need you to understand, we need to be busy with the mission of God's work. We need to be carrying the message, and we should be motivated by the love of God to do it. So what should we do, Brother Lee? I'm admonishing you, and I'm encouraging you. Go. Go and be a witness to the nations. Have the everlasting covenant that God has provided for you and go and touch the world. Everything I give, I give to you. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing, Everybody I surrender, I surrender all, all to you. Every little thing I give, I give to you, Lord. Withholding nothing, withholding nothing. Withholding nothing, withholding nothing, I 
We thank you for the message we have just heard. Father, we thank you for this digital format of being able to worship you and obey you this first day of the week. We ask that you be with us as we go out into the world, as we leave this assembly, and just watch over each and every one of us until we assemble again. Continue to guide our hearts and guide our minds, Father, so that we can put your will and glorify you first. We thank you and love you as we pray through Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen.